Good morning, friends. Welcome again to Sabbath School Study Hour. Coming to you here from the Amazing Facts offices in Sacramento, California. I'd like to welcome those who are joining us live across the country and around the world, as well as those who are viewing this on the various networks. Uh, we'd like to remind you that um, we're in our lesson courtly dealing with the subject of education. And it's not too late if you don't have a lesson courtly. We would encourage you to uh, get one. You can get one at an Adventist church nearby, or you can download today's lesson from the Amazing Facts website. Today we're on lesson number six. It's entitled, More Lessons from the Master Teacher. And uh, also want to remind you that this week, our lesson study, if you're watching live, it's 9 a.m. Pacific Time. But next week, we're going to start Sabbath School one hour later. So it'll actually be 10 uh, a.m. Pacific Time. So those of you are watching live, just take note of that. Um, well, before we get to our lesson, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that we're able to open up your word and study together in such an important lesson, looking at the example of Jesus and learning from him. So we ask your blessing upon our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Pastor Doug, we have an important lesson talking about Jesus, the master teacher. And uh, maybe just before we get to our lesson, we'd like to let folks know about our free offer that we have yep. uh, it's a book entitled Down From His Glory, and this is our free offer. If you're in North America, we'll be happy to send this to you. The number to call for that is just simply 866-788-3966, or if you'd like, you'll be able to get a digital download of this book. To do so, you want to text the code uh, SH139 to the number 40544, and you'll be able to get a digital copy of uh, the book Down From His Glory. And Pastor Doug, uh, this coming Friday evening, for those who are watching this live, we've got something very special that is going to begin at 7 p.m. Pacific time on Friday. Yeah, I was excited when I just pulled into the church uh, parking lot that I saw on either side of the entrance. It's got an advertisement, Revelation Now. And we're going to be presenting a global evangelistic program. It'll be global because it will be on both satellite television and on the Internet, Facebook, YouTube, every viable means we can think of to uh, share this evangelistic series that's talking about some of the major prophecy, prophecies in Revelation and uh, how it relates to what's going on in the world today and how people can be ready for that. And uh, you can participate. It's free in your home, in your church, for those that have churches that are meeting in various stages. And uh, simply go to the website called Revelation Now and you'll see all the advertising materials, things you can do to invite your neighbors. Send the link on to your friends. Encourage them to tune in because people are more interested in prophecy now with everything happening with the pandemic and the social unrest and the political polarization and the fires and the floods and uh, the economy. People are wondering what in the world is going on. And so this is a great time to share the gospel. We won't always have the freedom we have now. Invite your friends to go to Revelation Now. It'll also be on 3ABN and AFTV, as well as streaming through the Internet. Okay, so that's Friday, October the 23rd is when that begins. Well, Pastor Doug, should we take a look at our lesson? It's an yes. important one. We do have a memory verse, and the memory verse comes from Mark chapter 10, verse 52. And the words of Jesus, then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus on the road. Now that story is going to come up a little later in the lesson. It's where Jesus heals Bartimaeus. But in the first section here, and we're learning, of course, lessons about the master. Now we'll be going to Genesis because we believe Jesus does not appear really for the first time in the New Testament. You find Christ even in the Old Testament. These are called Christophanies, where God, the Son, was speaking to man in the Old Testament. And, uh, you know, all things that were made were made by him being Jesus, and that would include Adam and Eve. But you see right at the beginning, when, uh, when Adam and Eve sinned, the response of what they did, or I should say Jesus' response to sin, was one of compassion. Their response was shame and blame, and they ran. And you can see here in Genesis chapter 3, and I'll read verses 8 through 10, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees in the garden. And then the Lord called to Adam and said, 
where are you? And he said, well, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Now, when God asks Adam, where are you? It's not that God, God really didn't know. You, you can read, I think it's Psalm 137, you know, where shall I flee from your presence? Mm -hmm. We can't hide from God. Reminds me of when I'd play hide and seek with the kids in the house when they were little. And, uh, you know, I'd say, here I come. And you'd go and I'd see their, their feet sticking out from behind the curtains and so where are you? <laughs> you know, I knew where they were. But, um, you know, God sometimes asks these rhetorical questions. You've disobeyed. Where has it brought you is really what he's asking. And it's interesting that the first question that God asks in the Bible is, where are you? And because man ran from God. When you get to the New Testament, the first question that is asked in the gospel is the wise men looking for Jesus. They say, where is he? And the first question in the Bible is when the devil questions God's word. Hath God said? And so when we doubt God's word, it can lead to sin and it separates us from God. You know, Pastor Doug, just that, those three little interesting facts that you brought up about the first questions in the Bible. Um, the Bible begins by describing a problem, but then we find a solution in the New Testament and the mm -hmm. solution to the problem is Jesus. Mm -hmm. He's the solution to the problem. Now, uh, Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2 uh, emphasizes uh, why sin is such a problem. Uh, we read there, but your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So a part of the problem with sin is it separates us from God. Mm -hmm. God is a holy God. Sin cannot dwell in the presence of God. And so we find Adam and Eve running, hiding from God and yet, despite their sin, God comes to look for them. God is the one who initiates this reunion. Mm -hmm. He's the one coming to look for them. And that's the way it's been throughout human history. God has been reaching out, calling us to come back to him. Yeah. And, and sin actually separates not just us from God. Sin separates from each other. Mm -hmm. I know you've done some marriage counseling. Mm -hmm. and in almost every case, the, uh, the friction is caused by sin and selfishness, typically pride which is the sort of the mother of all sins. And sin not only separates us from God, sin separates us from each other. Sin separates us from us. Uh, you know, a lot of people have shame and guilt. They, they you know, trying to run away from themselves because they're, they don't want to live with themselves. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but Jesus, his love is reconciling. It does the opposite of sin. It reconnects us with God, which is the beginning to reconnecting with each other and even finally feeling joy and peace uh, that we are forgiven and we're new creatures. We're s uh, united with ourselves, you might say. So the Bible gives us this, um, this hope. It talks about the first Adam, mm -hmm. which of course is the father of all. And through his disobedience, through his sin, death comes because all have sinned. And when we get to the New Testament, we read about a second Adam, and Paul in particular illustrates this for us how that through the second Adam, Christ, we find forgiveness. So the first Adam brings mm -hmm. death, but the second Adam brings life and peace. I, I, why don't you look up, I didn't have it in my notes, you know the first prophecy in the Bible, it talks about that reconciliation, Genesis 3.15, I believe it's Genesis 3.15, mm -hmm. where he talks about the, you know, the curse and the, the enmity. And it's God talking to uh, the devil in the form of the serpent. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman the woman being the church, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So here you've got the first prophecy that the seed of the woman, this promised seed, that woman that brings forth the man child there in Revelation, he is going to be the solution for the problem began by the first Adam. Christ is going to be the, the second Adam, you know, in the same way that children uh, often come in the image of their parents. Uh, Jesus, in a sense, was a type of Adam, but um, he's, the, he's the second Adam. And maybe I'll read Romans 5, and this is a, a lengthy passage, but it's very important. A lot of good theology in here. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to 19. Paul is writing here. Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered the world, and death came through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there's no law. In other words, the law had to exist if sin existed. So <laughs> all the way back at the beginning, when God said to Cain, you know, sin lies at your door, um, must have been a sin to murder way back mm -hmm. there in the beginning. 
Nevertheless, de death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type. Here, here Paul says, Adam is a type of him who was to come, meaning Christ. Um, it's interesting that Adam fell in the garden. Jesus overcame in the desert. It just, I mean, Adam fell into sin, surrounded by every good thing to eat. He didn't need to eat the forbidden fruit. Jesus resisted when he was surrounded by rocks and, and dirt and the, the hunger and the thirst and fasting. Um, but the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, the sin of Adam, much more the grace of God and the gift of God and the gift by grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And you know, I just love this truth that if anybody out there knows that because of the sin of Adam, we've got problems, as real as that is, it is just as real because of the holiness of Jesus, we can have victory. And so he's saying, look, if you believe that because of Adam's sin, it's caused a problem, then don't disbelieve that because of Jesus' victory, we can have victory. Um, in the same way, Christ abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense, that of Adam, death reigned through the one, much more, those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteousness, through his righteous act, the free gift came to all, resulting in justification in life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience obedience many may be made righteous and i i love that verse because i think i have no doubt i fully believe because of adam's sin i got a problem i ought to have the same faith because of jesus righteousness i can have the victory you know pastor doug it's interesting the defeat begins in a garden when mm -hmm. adam and eve sinned the victory begins in a garden when jesus prayed not my will thy will be done that's right and of course the cross the eternal home of the redeemed puts us back in a garden but a garden restored in the New Jerusalem. Yeah, and it was on the sixth day that Adam goes to sleep, his side is opened up, and God takes out a rib. And uh, as a result of that, then uh, the church, his bride is born, I mm -hmm. should say. And then Christ on the sixth day of the week, his side is opened up. That flow of blood and water come out, and the church is it's born, born, his bride. And so there's a lot of interesting parallels between the first and the second Adam that you can find in the Bible. Now, Pastor Doug, you mentioned a little earlier how that Jesus gained the victory uh, when he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. And there are some parallels between that uh, and how Adam fell and how Christ overcame in the three areas of temptation. Yeah, and uh, you know, there's that verse in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. Uh, well, starting with verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, and here's verse 16, mm -hmm. the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is of the world, and the world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that does the word of God abides forever. So those three things, sin is divided in three principal categories here. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the same, those are the areas where Adam fell, it says, and Eve. The tree was good for food. You got the lust of the flesh, pleasant to the eyes. You get the lust of the eyes, It'll be desirable to make you wise. You'll be like God, the pride of life. It's, you know, worship. You'll be like God. Then Jesus in the desert, he overcomes in those same areas. And you can read this, of course, in Luke 4 and in Matthew chapter 3. It says, command these stones to become bread. There's the lust of the flesh. And he had a victory. The devil showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory, in the beauty of it, lust of the eyes. Jesus resisted. He had victory. Throw yourself down from here, the pride of life. You'll be you know, demonstrating your power. He resisted that temptation. He had victory. So in all the categories where Adam and Eve fell, Jesus overcame so that we could be overcomers. Absolutely. 
Um, for those of you who are joining us live, uh, I know there are folks who are watching <coughs> on Facebook, and you might have a Bible question maybe related to the subject that we're talking about. If you would like to go ahead and just type in your Bible question there on Facebook, and we have Santiago that will be sending the questions to me, and we'll try and get some of these questions in between our study. Um, Pastor Doug, we have uh, Jordan who is actually asking, his question is, why are there so many religions in the world? Well, good. A uh, good, good question. You know, of all the different religions, you've got, you know, major religions are Christianity, Islam, Buddhism. Um, you've got, you know, Sikhism and uh, um, oh, what the religion in uh, China, well, Confucianism, but I'm thinking of Anatism and, and uh, Buddhism. Buddhism, I mentioned, yeah. No religion is more divided than Christianity. And I think the reason is that y you try to hide a diamond in broken glass. And the devil has surrounded the diamond of truth in Christianity with a lot of broken glass to just camouflage it. And people, how many times do we know people that will say, well, look at if, uh, why would it be a Christian? Look at what the Christians do. You know, you look at them evangelists on television that are begging for everyone's money and brandishing their, their uh, you know, golden Rolexes and, and uh, you know, everything's gilded on their set and they're wanting us to buy them a new jet. <laughs> and, he said, and so there, there's so much hypocrisy in Christianity and there's so much scandal in Christianity and there's so many confusing, bizarre doctrines in Christianity. People look at all the broken glass and they say, who wants to be a Christian? Because they're not looking at the diamond. They're not looking at the real thing. And uh, so I think that's one reason is the mm -hmm. devil's trying to create division. I think another reason... Jesus said to the disciples, all men will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. So Christ said, the world will know that you are mine by your love for one another. The devil heard that and he thought, well, if they're going to know that Christ is true by their love for one another, I need to frustrate that plan by having them all divided and fighting. So instead of the church being united and people seeing that, that the devil sought to fragment Christianity more than any religion to turn people away from it. Okay, we have another question that's come from uh, Shonda, and she writes, why is Jesus called an angel in the Old Testament if he is God? Well, when we say the word angel, some people automatically think of one of these seraphim or cherubim-like creatures <laughs> with, with wings and that are messengers and they're ministering servants. The word angel actually means messenger, and Christ is called the archangel, uh, and that just means the greatest messenger or the chief of the angels. It doesn't mean he isn't God. And so in the Old Testament, sometimes Christ appeared as the angel of uh, God or the messenger of God. And, and the reason you know he's God, when he appears to Joshua, Joshua sees this majestic-like warrior standing with a sword drawn. And he says, are you for our enemies? Or are you for us? And he says, but neither. I'm coming as um, the, the general of God's armies. And he says, put your shoes off your feet for the place you're mm -hmm. standing is holy ground. And Joshua gets down to worship. And so you don't worship anyone but God. That's what the commandments say. And so this messenger, who's sometimes called Michael, the archangel, he has the... Um, he comes as a messenger of God. Jesus brought the greatest message to our world. Okay. So maybe one more question before we get back to the lesson. Uh, Vaughn is asking, Devon, um, is, is the time of probation now? Are we now living in the time of, well, yes. When you say probation, not close of probation. Mm. Everybody in your life has a probationary period. That's the time you're alive. Uh, as long as your probation personally hasn't closed, this is your time to know and accept Jesus. Has the close of probation happened? No. Uh, when that happens, you're going to start seeing the seven last plagues fall. So, uh, no, there's still time. Uh, but you don't know when your probation mm -hmm. might close. Uh, you know, there are people who lived a little while after their probation closed, after Judas went out and uh, Jesus washed his feet. It says he went out, Satan entered him. His probation had closed at that point. When Saul went to the witch... And he grieved away the spirit. His probation had closed. And so uh, there's a time when you can even still be alive, like the people outside the ark for seven days. The sun kept shining, but the door had shut before the flood came. Their probation had closed. So, you know, I don't, you don't want to push God's mercy 
Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Okay, well then moving on with our uh, quarterly, with our lesson for today. Monday's lesson is titled On the Run, and we have the story of Jacob, after he deceived his father, yeah. how that he had to flee because of the threats of his brother, and he's wandering there in the uh, wilderness, and it's nighttime, and you can just imagine how he must feel. Here he has uh, not only you know, made his brother mad, but he has deceived his father, whom he respected, and now he's separated from his mother, whom he loved, and he's all alone. He's got nothing. And yeah. he realizes all of this is because of, of my sin. Yeah. Now, probably he had been repenting, you know, as he was leaving home, asking for forgiveness. He had a humble heart. But then God shows in a very special way his grace and his forgiveness that night when Jacob lies down and goes to sleep in a place called Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jacob, um, he deceived his father and he stole his brother's birthright. And then they knew that uh, Esau was saying to his friends, as soon as my father's dead, I'm going to kill him. Mm. And they thought, you know, uh, Jacob, Isaac actually thought he was going to die much sooner than he did. He blessed his sons. He says, you know, the day of my departure is coming. He blessed his sons. Well, he lived another 40 years. <laughs> he, he didn't know. He outlived his wife, actually. Um, but um, so Jacob's leaving home under pretense of, you know, going to marry a girl. And he actually was going to find a girl who believed in Jehovah. His parents were so grieved that Esau had married the local Canaanite pagan girls that uh, going across the country to a relative, sort of, he's looking for refuge from his brother's wrath, uh, he feels isolated. Now, we can read about it here in Genesis chapter 28, verse 10. And Jacob went out from Beersheba, and he went towards Haran, that's on the other side of the Euphrates. And he came to a certain place, and he stayed there all night. We later know this is Bethel, because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down at that place to sleep. And then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land in which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants will be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Meaning the Messiah would come through the line of Jacob. Behold, I'm with you and I will keep you wherever you go. And I'll bring you back to this land. And he did keep him and bring him back. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken for you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely. And this is a very vivid dream. And he knows it's a vision from God. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? And it is none other than the house of God. That's where we get the word Bethel. Mm -hmm. And this is the gate of heaven. And um, it's interesting that the word Babylon means uh, gate of heaven, which is the counterfeit of Bethel <laughs> being the gate of heaven. But of course, uh, Babylon is, uh, I think that's the Chaldean or a different language for it. So... Um, he thinks that God's abandoned him and God comes to him and says, because you've humbled yourself and you've turned to me and you've repented of your sin, I'm not abandoning you, but you wanted the blessing. You wanted the blessing of the firstborn. I told your mother that you were gonna, the youngest was going to get it. You didn't need to deceive your brother to get it. You should have trusted me. But he still forgives him and he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you. The Messiah will come through your line. And of course, if you look at that story, like all the stories in the Bible, you get an illustration of the gospel you have Jacob um, sinning against his father, and yet his father still blesses him. Mm -hmm. And he needed to repent in order to receive that blessing. So we have sinned against our Heavenly Father, and yet he still blesses us. And in order for us to receive the inheritance that he wants to give us, we have to repent, yeah. as Jacob did. So, you know, there's so many stories in the Bible that yeah, illustrate yeah, yeah. the grace of God and his love for it, for us, for people. And even, you know, even when he did that dastardly thing of stealing his brother's blessing, there's a great analogy there of the gospel. The way that he gets the blessing from the father, he puts on the robes of mm. the elder brother. And he covers himself with a sacrifice. It's a lamb. Right. And he's got the lamb on his hands and on his neck and his brother's clothes. And basically the father who is blind gives him the brother's blessing based on the brother's robe and the smell of the brother. And um, 
you know, we, because we put on Christ's robe of righteousness and because of the sacrifice of the lamb, the father closes his eyes to our sin and he blesses us. Mm. So, you know, even though he shouldn't have done what he did, there's, there's still an analogy in there. And we get the blessing of our older brother, Christ. Yeah, he is the, exactly. He's yeah. the elder brother that uh, gives it's us a that great blessing. great analogy. Um, somebody sent in a question, Pastor Doug. Um, it's a good question. Uh, Jeremy's asking, do you think that all religions focus on the same God but just have different beliefs? No. You know, I, I believe that God is good to many people in many religions. Mm. I don't want anyone to think that you know, God does not hear the prayers of anybody but one particular church. Because Jesus said the Lord sends his sunshine and the rain on the just and the unjust. And, uh, and even the, one of the apostles, and I remember, forget the verse that it tells us that uh, people everywhere who do what's right, they call unto him, that he hears them. And so, uh, you know, God is a loving God. But uh, there is only one true God, and a lot of religions of the world have a very distorted picture of God. You think about some of those terrible pagan religions that would even offer their children in the fire. And so they had a very corrupted picture of God, and that's, they're not worshiping the same God when they're worshiping a God like that. And so. you probably wonder why the devil has been trying to misrepresent God. So there is something about worshiping a God that is being misrepresented. The devil's trying to misrepresent mm -hmm. the character and the qualities of God. So there must be something about knowing what the God is like. The Bible tells us to know God is to love him. Yeah. And you're not going to love a God that, um, you know, hates you or tortures you. And uh, even in Christianity, yeah. mm -hmm. there are many who believe that God is going to torture the wicked throughout endless ages. And it creates a false picture of what God's like. Totally yeah. different than the God of the Bible. Even in the time of Christ, when Jesus came, he came to show them what the Father was like and said he came unto his own and his own received him not. They didn't know him. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they didn't, e even the, the Jews, Jesus said, look, if you, if you uh, were God's children, then you would believe me because I've been sent by God. Yeah. And he said, you, you have a whole different picture of God than th the truth. I came to show you what he's really like. That reminds me of a, a statement that mm -hmm. um, I, I think both of us got in our email yesterday which illustrates the, the love of God. The, the, and it's just a beautiful statement that comes from Testimonies, Volume 5. Maybe I'll just read it, Pastor Doug, because it is uh, encouraging. Testimonies volume, page, uh, vol Testimonies, Volume 5, page 740. It says, All of the paternal love, which has come down from generation to generation through the channel of human hearts, all of the springs of tenderness, which have opened to the souls of men, are but as a tiny rill to the boundless ocean when compared with the infinite and exhaustless love of God. Tongue cannot utter it. Pain cannot portray it. You may meditate upon it every day of your life. You may search the scriptures diligently in order to understand it. You may summon every power and capability that God has given you in the endeavor to comprehend the love and the compassion of the Heavenly Father. And yet, mm -hmm. says there is an infinity beyond you may study that love for ages and you can never be fully you can never fully comprehend the length and the breadth the depth and the height of the love of god in giving his son to die for the world eternity itself can never fully reveal it yet as we study the bible and meditate upon the life of christ and the plan of redemption these great themes will open to our understanding more and more mm. we'll spend eternity trying to comprehend the love of god and we'll never plumb the depths it reminds me of that song where it says if every person was an author and uh, all of the... Um, the love of God. The yeah. love of God. Yeah, all of the, the reeds in the world were a pen and the sky was your parchment. If we would think the ocean drained, drained and were full, yeah. every stalk on earth a quill and were the, hev the sc heavens a scroll, man would still not be able to write, write the, the love, love of God. God. <laughs> and I, I also <laughs> forgot the words too. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful hymn. Yeah. All right, well, moving right along, we've got uh, quite a bit to cover here. Uh, Tuesday's lesson is entitled Rabbi Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a parallel between Genesis chapter 1, where it says, in the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. And of course, John chapter 1, that says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And then verse 4 is interesting. It says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing that God created was light. Mm -hmm. Here we have that parallel in John where Jesus is described as the light. And all life 
is dependent upon light, the light mm -hmm. of the sun. That's right. All spiritual life is dependent upon Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and if you go on and you jump to verse 9 in that same passage, it says, And that was the true light that gives light to every man that comes into the world. And then go to verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I went through the Gospel of John. John is definitely the most visual of the apostles. And just in the first chapter of John, there are like 32 references to light and sight. I mean, words like behold, light see we saw him come and see i mean he's a very very visual <laughs> disciple and so when jesus said i am the light of the world and we we come to christ and we see now the reason jesus is qualified to be rabbi jesus is because uh he came from the presence of god he is the fountainhead of all knowledge and wisdom and so who in the universe could be more qualified to teach us than Jesus, who knows everything. The disciples said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. And Jesus said, I've been so long time with you, Philip. He who has seen me mm -hmm. has seen the Father. That is, a, you know, when you stop and think about that for a minute, the kindness and the love and the healing and the blessings that were illustrated and displayed in the life of Jesus, uh, that's not somehow standing in opposition to what God is like. That is what God the Father is like. He is a God of love and compassion and forgiveness. Not to say that there isn't a God of, of justice, because we do see mm -hmm. in the life of Christ moments where justice is displayed, in particular the cleansing of the sanctuary. Yeah. That even astounded the disciples when Jesus cleansed the sanctuary. So, yep, we see this beautiful blend of love and compassion, mercy and justice in the life of Christ. Yeah, and so, um, you know, he is, uh, of course, knowledge incarnate. He is wisdom incarnate. Matter of fact, I think we have a couple of verses. If you want, you can read uh, 1 Corinthians 1.24, and then I'll read Colossians 2, verses 2 and 3. It says, uh, But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. That's 1 Corinthians 1.24. Yeah, so Christ is the wisdom of God. Is he wanted to show his wisdom. A you know, everything he said, they came back. They are supposed to arrest him, and the guards came back and said, Never man spake like this man. And boy, I wish I could have been on earth back then mm. and uh, seen that. Colossians 2, verses 2 and 3. That their hearts might be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, and notice here, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden, now he's in, he says God, the Father and Christ are God, in whom are hidden, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so Jesus had in him, I mean, you know, it's fun sometimes now when you just go to Google. I don't know how we ever live without it. You go to Google and you type in anything and all of the wisdom of the world is at your fingertips in the flash of a, you know, uh, of a moment. And uh, I'm, I'm getting spoiled now where I used to search my Bible software. I'm finding Google, the search engine for the Bible <laughs> in Google is actually pretty good and it gives you a lot of options. But um, you know, everything you might know that can be known, Christ had all of that mm. in him, all that wisdom. And so he's, of course, the most qualified rabbi and teacher. Uh, Pastor Doug, we have a question that's uh, coming in from uh, Jessamy. She asks, uh, what is true repentance? You know, true repentance is a sorrow for sin, not just sorry that you're in trouble because the Pharaoh repented and uh, then he went right back to it. He just was sorry about the judgment. Uh, Judas repented. He went and hung himself. That's not the right kind of repentance, but it's a sorrow for sin, sorry that we've hurt God, and a willingness to turn away from it. And so someone said, you per you, repentance is when you perform a U-turn on the road of life, and it means you turn and so whenever the Bible says repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it's talking about, you know, humbling ourselves before God, confessing our sins, and then asking for his power to turn from those sins and walk in a newness of life. The Bible says that it's God that gives us repentance. So as we turn to him and we grow closer to him, our, our repentance will grow. Uh, it'll be deeper and fuller. Uh, here's another question that uh, Jasmine has. It's a great question. I don't think I've seen this one before. It says... Is there a uh, correlation between the dove, Noah sent out, and the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus like a dove? Yeah, great question. 
You know, historically, the dove has been a symbol of peace. Yeah, not too many people are attacked by doves. They're mm -hmm. sort of gentle birds. They coo. And uh, they're a bird that is a bird of sacrifice, kind of like, you know, in the mammals, you've got the lamb was a sacrifice. For the poor people, the dove was a sacrifice. And uh, Joseph and Mary had no money, so they brought turtle doves as a sacrifice. And so the, the dove, when Noah sent it out, and it came back with an olive leaf in its mouth. That's around the world. This sort of been, I think even the United Nations uses that as an emblem of peace. And that God, you know, the, the judgment is over now. Man is at peace with God. You get the rainbow in the heavens. And so when the Holy Spirit came into Christ's life, I believe God sends peace into the person's life when they're baptized. Mm. And uh, it, there's, it's a symbol of reconciliation as well. Maybe one of the signs of the Holy Spirit dwelling within the heart of a person is a peace. The Bible speaks of a peace that passes all understanding. Mm -hmm. Amen. And there's a joy, especially a baptism. When someone yeah. is baptized and they give their life to Christ, the Holy Spirit gives them peace and joy. And of course, we see that uh, symbolized in the dove, yes. symbolized by the Holy Spirit. Yes. Uh, our next part of our lesson then goes to a Wednesday where we're talking about, uh, it's got an interesting title. It says, A Woman Talks Back. And we have the story here of Matthew chapter 15, 21 to 28. And maybe I'll just read this and sure. Pastor Doug, you just interrupt as you, you want to add. It says, uh, Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region. She cried out to him, saying, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But Jesus answered and said, and he said, I am not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and she worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered again and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her and said, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Yeah, this is a... a it's a very interesting story because people are shocked to hear Jesus say to someone who's praying for healing for their child, uh, refer to them as a dog. And uh, that it's not right to take the children's food and I'm only sent to the lost house of the children of Israel. And they think, wow, everybody else in the Bible that comes to Jesus and prays, he answers their prayer. But uh, in our lesson today, we've got a couple of examples where God, one, doesn't answer at first, he says no at first, but then he says yes. And with Bartimaeus, he doesn't answer right away. He has to continue crying, but then the answer comes. And uh, we'll get to that in a moment. But uh, first, I think uh, it's interesting to note, Christ is like, he, he comes uh, with a ministry like Elijah's to bring revival. And Elijah went and stayed with a woman of Zidon and performed a miracle. And he raised her son. Here Jesus, this is the only time that it records that Jesus leaves the territory of Israel. And uh, this woman comes and she says, you know, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. And she's speaking to them and the disciples say, oh, it's a Gentile, send her away. Jesus answers her the way the typical rabbi would have done back then. But he knows, as soon as he knows the woman's there, matter of fact, the only miracle he does up north is to heal that woman's daughter because he went to do it like when he crosses the sea and he heals the demoniac. The only thing he did across that sea was heal the demoniac. He went to do that job. He went to heal her daughter, but he tests her faith. Mm -hmm. He answers her, though, kind of a harsh answer, the way that the Jews would normally look upon the Gentiles as dogs. But she says, even the little dogs get the crumbs. Now keep in mind, Jesus later tells a parable mm -hmm. about the rich man and Lazarus, where he said, poor Lazarus, who's a type of the Gentile, only comfort he gets is the dogs lick his sores and he's wanting the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table. And the Bible tells us that Lazarus ends up in Abraham's bosom and the rich man, a symbol of the Jewish nation, is outside. Meaning just because you're uh, born in a particular faith doesn't save you. And so Jesus was using this and he's hoping the disciples will put these things together. Of course, he heals her and he says, woman, he, he answers her with respect. Uh, and by the way, the word, word woman there is, well, you know, he said to his mother woman. The word woman there is madam. It's a term of respect, believe it or not. And uh, great is your faith. 
let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed that very hour. So he answers her prayer. But he tries to illustrate, uh, this is the first miracle he really does for a Gentile like this. I think he also heals the centurion's servant. Mm -hmm. But you it know, stands out. What, what impresses me about the verse is uh, Jesus says to her, I was sent except, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then it says, she came and she worshipped him. So yeah. here is a Gentile recognizing the divinity of Christ. She's worshipping Jesus even though she has not yet received what she was asking When he for. stops and talks to her, she sees an opening. Right. I just read through this in Desire yeah. of Ages, and she yeah, saw hope. that, so y you know, sometimes you read the words, you go, well, that was a harsh thing to say. <laughs> you have to see his face. You have to see his body language. Mm -hmm. She understood there was mercy and an opening in the way he said that. He basically said, well, you know how the Jews are. <laughs> um, we're not supposed to take the children's food and give it to the dogs, but I think he's smiling at her, and she, she felt she welcome enough so. to come. And you know, partly why this happened this way is I think Jesus is giving his disciples an opportunity. It was sort of a test to yeah. see were they listening, were they looking at the life of Christ? And unfortunately in this case they seem to fail the test because they say, send her away. She cries after us. Yeah, she's making a spectacle. Yeah, so um, of course eventually the disciples had to learn that Jesus was for everyone, not just for the Jews. Yeah. Um, that brings us to Thursday's lesson, and uh, this is a great story too. It talks about um, a student who gets it. Yeah. And Mark chapter 8, verse 31, 33, um, we have Jesus actually telling his disciples that he would die, and yet Peter says, Lord, far be it from you, this will not happen to you. And Jesus have to s has to say, get thee behind me, Satan. Uh, it's rather remarkable that here the devil uses Peter, who just a little while earlier had said, you are the Christ, mm -hmm. to try and tempt Jesus to not follow through with what he knew was God's will. Yeah, I think there's about eight times in the Bible, seven or eight in the Gospels, where Jesus said um, what his mission was to go and to die. And it tells us in Luke, they understood, this is Luke 18, 34, they understood none of those things. But this saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things that were spoken. So here he's got his apostles, they're students, and they're just, they're just not getting it. But Mary Magdalene got it when mm. she brought her gift. He said, mm. she's anointed me for my burial. He understood he's going to die for my sin. Mm. And um, he, said, he said, she anointed me in advance. And Bartimaeus called him the son of David. He understood who he was. And I think maybe you want to read that, Mark, yeah, that's uh, a great story. Mark 10, verse 46. It says, now when they came <coughs> to Jericho... As he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great multitude, with a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timenius, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still, kind of like what Jesus did with that woman that had the demon-possessed daughter. So mm -hmm. Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and he came to Jesus. So Jesus asked him, said, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I might receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. It's interesting. He told the rich young ruler, Follow me. And uh, you know, do you all have treasure in heaven? And he walks away. He tells the blind man, go, and he follows him. <laughs> and so the blind man has nothing but rags, and he throws aside his garment when he comes to Christ, which is a symbol of us. You know, a blind man's garments probably aren't very pretty. And he throws his garments aside, and we cast aside our righteousness, our self-righteousness, and we come to Christ. And, um, but the rich man, he walks away with his royal robes. He doesn't follow him. Mm-hmm. And it's just it's such an incredible contrast. And you have both stories that aren't very far from each other in the gospel. Um, and it's also similar to that lady where it says they told him he was crying out, be quiet. They're, he's saying, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, he calls all the louder. Now, I think in one of the gospels, it actually says that there was two blind men and uh, outside of Jericho. And so it's uh, probably the same story, just that one was more, uh, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was more outspoken. And uh, he follows Jesus down the road. He's got nothing but his vision, but he's happy. Mm. And, uh, you know, they say that uh, uh, you can give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. You can teach him to fish 
and you can feed them for a lifetime. Right. And Jesus said, look, I could uh, give you a donation because you're a beggar on the roadside, or I can give you your sight, and then you can work. <laughs> and so, you know, he, he gave him what he really needed. So he's rejoicing. He said, I'm not worried about a donation. I'm, I'm interested in, now I've, I've got my sight. You know, I think it also teaches us that sometimes in order for us to realize the gift that Christ wants to give us, we have to sort of reach rock bottom. You have the rich man who walked away sorrowful. He didn't follow Jesus. Uh, he had all these riches, whereas Bartimaeus yeah. had nothing. And the little bit that he did have, he was willing to cast aside for Jesus. Another important point in this story is when he was calling out, Son of David, have mercy on me. The crowd told him, be quiet. But it says many told him to be quiet. They said, you're making a spectacle, just like the disciples said about that woman. She's crying after us. So one of the things we learn about Jesus is that Jesus is patient with people. And something else is he doesn't always answer the first time we mm -hmm. ask. With Bartimaeus and with that woman, they kept crying after him. Sometimes people, I know our friends who are listening, you may be praying about an issue, praying for victory, praying your eyes are open, pray for someone else you love, and you may have to pray for a while. Because God doesn't answer right away does not mean he's not going to answer, and it doesn't mean he doesn't love you. Uh, God honors persistence is a very important lesson here. So when we look at Jesus, the master teacher, we mm -hmm. can see different qualities and characteristics and these qualities are the qualities of God the Father because Jesus came to reveal what God is like. And just as Jesus came to reveal the truth about God, so Jesus wants his followers to reveal the truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Hebrews, we find Paul speaking to the church and he says, you ought to be teachers by now, but you need somebody to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. This is Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. So the real goal uh, of the Christian is not just to stay on the milk yeah. which is being unskilled in the word. But as Paul says, he wants us to have solid food and grow up into the full stature mm -hmm. of what Christ wants us to be. Yeah, absolutely. And, so, and not only does uh, Paul say this here, I think Peter also said, you know, we should desire the sincere milk of the word, but it, we shouldn't be just eating baby pablum all the time. Now, there's a time for that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the challenge for a pastor is if you've got, you know, several people in your congregation, you're going to have some people that are, children, babies in their faith. they are just come to Christ. And then you can have some that maybe all their lives and they want the meat. And you got to kind of mix up a little bit of something for everybody <laughs> when you're preaching. But, and Jesus did that. He would do parables that had incredible depth. And yet the kids would sit there and go, I get it. You know, there was something real simple in it that they understood on the, on the surface. And yet there was something much deeper that had meat in, in the parable as well. And uh, he modeled that teaching uh, for us that we should follow. We'd like to remind those who are joining us about our free offer. It is book entitled Down From His Glory and we'll be happy to send this to anyone in North America. Just call the number 866-788-3966 and you can ask for free offer number 154. Uh, you can also get a digital download of this book if you text the code SH139 to the number 40544. We'll send you an email with the link and you'll be able to download the book. It's called Down From His Glory. And Pastor Doug, as we mentioned at the beginning of the program, we're very excited about our upcoming uh, online Bible prophecy seminar. It's called Revelation Now. The tagline is everything is about to change. Yeah. And uh, this is something that anyone can participate in. Just simply go to the website, revelationnow.com. It begins at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Friday, October the 23rd. And it goes on through November 14 because at the time, see, some people watch this program live, but then it's rebroadcast three weeks later after all the uh, s subtitles and so forth are, are attached and sent off to the satellite networks. And so program should still be in progress even when this airs. And uh, it won't be too late to at least take in some of the, the final broadcasts. So you can just go to the Revelation Now website. You'll see the schedule there. And uh, it's a great way for you to bring others to Christ. And uh, with everything happening in the world right now, I, I can't imagine a better opportunity when people are going to be more open to the things of the gospel. You know, Pastor Doug, we're looking forward to this. So we just want to encourage those of you, be a part of this Revelation Now seminar. 